Coming up on We Talk News This Week, a lopsided prisoner exchange between the U.S. and Russia. Basketball star Brittany Griner is freed for an international arms dealer. Plus, no more cashless ATMs as hundreds of dispensaries scramble to create a cash-only transaction system again. And another cannabis giant company, Weed Maps, lays off 250 employees as the weed industry continues to struggle with a market correction. That's why Dutchie reorganized its management. All that and more on Cannabis News from Coast to Coast on We Talk News with Elena Pinto next. We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Elena Pinto. Big breaking news from the White House this week as the Biden administration participates in a prisoner swap with Russia to free WNBA star Brittany Griner. She had been behind bars in Russia since February and moved to a penal colony all for having a cannabis vape oil cartridge in her luggage at a Moscow airport. It's taken months of advocating, but now Griner is officially on her way home to the U.S., much to the delight of her family. So over the last nine months, you all have been um, so privy to one of the darkest moments of my life. And so today I'm just standing here um, overwhelmed with emotions, but... The most important emotion that I have right now is just sincere gratitude um, for President Biden and his entire administration. Um, he just mentioned this work is not easy and it has not been. There's been so many hands involved. Of course, the White House had to participate in some political wheeling and dealing to bring Brittany Griner home. Vote Pro podcast Phil Adams has more details on the prisoner swap and other stories from the nation's capital this week. Hi, this is Phil Adams from Vote Pro Podcast here with the Weed Talk News DC report. Brittany Griner has been freed by Russia after nearly 10 months of detention. The dramatic announcement was made by President Biden today after a high level prisoner exchange was agreed to between the two countries. The WNBA star and two time Olympic gold medalist had been detained and imprisoned on drug possession charges. The deal sent notorious Russian arms dealer Viktor Bout back to Russia in exchange for Griner, who had been transferred to a penal colony to begin a nine-year sentence. The swap did not include former United States Marine Paul Whelan, though the Biden administration had been working to secure his release as well. Whelan has been held by the Russians since 2018 on espionage charges and is serving a 16-year sentence. Griner boarded a plane on Thursday to arrive back in the United States within 24 hours. Congress has declined once again to include cannabis banking reform language in the National Defense Authorization Act. This comes as a disappointment to pro-reform lawmakers and advocates who had been looking to the large-scale defense bill as a vehicle for enacting provisions to protect financial institutions who serve the legal cannabis industry. Meanwhile, details of the so-called Safe Plus package are being negotiated by lawmakers and are emerging. That legislation could still advance through by the end of the year, either as part of an omnibus appropriations bill or as standalone legislation. D.C. lawmakers have approved legislation that would fundamentally change the medical cannabis program for residents of the nation's capital. In particular, the Medical Cannabis Amendment Act would eliminate existing caps on cannabis business licensing, provide tax relief to operators, and create new categories of regulated cannabis businesses. It would also codify adult self-certification as medical marijuana patients. The D.C. City Council approved the legislation by a 7-4 to four vote. That's the Weed Talk News D.C. report for this week. I'm Phil Adams from Vote Pro Podcast. The longer Congress drags its feet on passing safe banking legislation, the more issues it seems to create. On the heels of lawmakers slashing the safe language from that national defense spending bill, cannabis stocks plummeted drastically on Wall Street. 
not building much confidence for the financial future on the industry. And it's even impacting consumers now. Listen up because you may need to keep cold, hard cash handy on your next trip to the dispensary because cannabis is still federally illegal. Financial institutions are largely not allowed to work with cannabis companies, even if they're legal by state law. So you may have noticed if you ever use your debit card at the dispensary, the bud tender will round your total up to the nearest whole number and give you back change in cash. Well, that's because your purchase is actually being recorded as an ATM transaction through a point of banking system. But it seems the operators of these systems are starting to crack down. Well, this week, processors like NCR Corps Columbus Data Services started shutting down banking systems associated with cannabis retail shops, forcing them into a cash-only operation. And we're already seeing the impact take hold in some states, like Massachusetts. Companies like Pure Oasis in Dorchester have posted on social media informing their customers they will need cash when they come in. And AIR, a multi-state operator, also sent notice to its regular customers, letting them know payment for product can only be made via cash or a specific app until further notice. California, Illinois, and Massachusetts are just some of the states we've seen impacted so far. So be sure to hit the bank before your next trip to the dispensary. For now, let's get more news from Massachusetts this week. Here's Weed Talk News producer Tori Chamberlain with the Bay State Report. Hi, everyone. I'm Tori Chamberlain, and here's what's happening in the Bay State this week. In a massive move by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources to remove a ban on pesticides, licensed cannabis cultivators in the state will now be allowed to use certain pesticides on their crops. Now, this sounds alarming at first, but it's a wide range of mostly natural chemicals that are federally approved for use on hemp and tobacco. So they've already been used in this sort of cultivation space. It in they include bacteria that kill leaf eating worms, fertilizers and other fungicides that are pretty commonly used in cultivation. So there's no need to panic just yet. Now, this next story didn't happen in Massachusetts, but the company it involves does call the Bay State home. The U.S. National Labor Board ruled this week that Massachusetts-based Cureleaf violated labor law in Illinois, where it also operates, by refusing to bargain with unionized workers at a Chicago location there. Law states that a company must recognize and bargain with workers within 21 days of receiving a notice from their union, which Kiraleaf apparently failed to do. And more news for the MSO that is good or not so good, depending on who you are. Kiraleaf announced this week it's partnering with Ganjie. That's a grassroots council organization group that has a pretty strong reputation in cannabis for being the premier sommelier certification program of the industry. But there seems to be some mixed reaction out there, certainly that I've seen online. Cureleaf has touted the venture as a first of its kind cannabis education partnership, but those who consider themselves part of the legacy industry don't seem to be totally on board. I spoke with Maggie Wilson, CMO of Fruit Slabs and a certified sommelier herself about what she thinks about this partnership. I read the press release and one of the things that it said was like it wants to do, they want to do this in such a quick way so that they have tons of people who are certified as congiers, blah, 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 through Cureleaf. And it's like, do you want to do it right or do you want to do it fast? Because it mm. doesn't, it doesn't like, it's not a four hour training certification to learn about this plant. Like you wouldn't take a four hour training course and be like, I'm a lavender sommelier. I know everything about lavender. You would not, you would absolutely not. You would be like, I studied for years and learned about how this plant grows, where this plant grows, why this plant grows like this, what uses it has. You know, and you you really be become like you're not a botanist, but you literally are thinking about the plant, like as the plant. So whether you're a fan of the partnership or not, this is certainly going to be a big move that's going to impact the industry in some kind of way. That's it for the Bay State Report this week. I'm Tori Chamberlain. So while some companies are being pushed to go cash only, 
others are making cuts to their staff. And even more so, a pair of businesses are now facing allegations of falsely advertising the THC levels on their products. Deborah Borchardt has all the details in this week's Green Market Report. I'm Deborah Borchardt, and this is the business update for Weed Talk News from the Green Market Report. This week, two companies were accused of inflating THC levels for premium price products, both Steezy and VO Leasing, which makes the presidential cannabis products, were the subjects of lawsuits filed in California. Both sell products that claim to have high THC levels, but when tested were beyond the margin of error established by the state. Some were as off as much as 30 percent, so they are being accused of false advertising. Weed Maps said this week it was laying off 25 percent of its staff, or 175 people. The move is intended to cut expenses, but it will cost over $10 million in severance costs. Now, this comes shortly after longtime CEO Chris Beals departed the company and amid continuing losses at Weed Maps. And finally, a lawsuit was filed against the Facebook parent company, Meta, in connection with the cannabis Ponzi scheme, Juicy Fields. Marketing for investors of the scheme was done through social media. That is why they're going after Meta. The case involves 800 people from 50 different countries, and 2 billion euro is missing from these investor accounts. And those are your top headlines this week. I'm Deborah Borchart from the Green Market Report for We Talk News. Overseas, another government seems to be eager to go green. Last week, we told you about the efforts in Ireland to introduce a bill legalizing cannabis for personal use. And it seems lawmakers there are already making progress. Lex Pelger has the details from across the pond. I'm Lex Pelger from Whitewell Creations with this week's European Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. An Irish lawmaker introduced a bill to legalize cannabis possession. If passed, the bill would legalize the possession of up to 7 grams of cannabis and 2.5 grams of cannabis resin for personal use. The amendment does not reference the cultivation or sale of cannabis and focuses on removing criminal charges for personal use of the plant. The lawmaker introduced the bill, Gino Kenny of the People Before Profits Party, said, I believe the existing legislation is out of date and out of time. We need a different narrative around drug reform. Different parts of the world are looking at different models which do not criminalize people and which take a harm reduction approach. Ireland has one of the highest rates of cannabis use in Europe, but one of the most restrictive medical cannabis programs. This legislation is a welcome opening of their current laws. In Lithuania, the Parliament's Committee on Legal Affairs advanced cannabis decriminalization legislation. The proposed law would remove criminal penalties for personal amount use, but would include citations with fines ranging from 30 euros to 250 euros. Even though Lithuania joined the EU in 2004, for many years it was the only country in the Union to criminalize even the cultivation of hemp. But by 2018, not only was hemp allowed to be grown, the Parliament also voted to allow the medical use of cannabis for a small set of serious medical conditions. That being said, no patient has ever received approval for medical cannabis use. This decriminalization bill is another step in the right direction. Finally, in European hemp news, EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, has received applications from the European Industrial Hemp Association for two forms of CBD, CBD isolate and synthetic CBD. The industry group proposes a limit of 17.5 milligrams of CBD per day to be a safe level. A number of other hemp advocacy groups around the world have been questioning that low number, but the industry group said that based on the available literature and their own research, which has yet to be publicly released, that this is the correct number. The status of CBD in the EU is still in limbo, and one of the big questions will be, can CBD be added to food products? And if so, how much can people safely consume per day? That's the European Cannabis Report for this week. For more on the science side, see my newsletter on Substack, Cannabinoids and the People. I'm Lex Pelger from White Whale Creations, reporting for Weed Talk News. Back in the U.S., there's increasing support to update and change some medical marijuana laws, particularly in Michigan. Executive Director of the state's normal organization, Rick Thompson, has the details. Hello again, everyone. This is the Michigan Report with Rick Thompson on Weed Talk News. Let's begin. Well, there's a new survey out from Normal of Michigan, and it shows 
there is no serious interest among Michigan voters to rescind or retract any of the rights and privileges held by medical cannabis patients and caregivers. In a survey conducted from November 30th through December 6th, the Epic MRA polling company spoke to 600 likely voters and contacted 65% of them through mobile phones. Of those respondents, 66% said they favored keeping the medical laws the way they currently are or expanding the rights for sick people to use cannabis. Only 21% of respondents said they favored enacting restrictions on cannabis patients. Those demographics with the greatest support for adding new rights include liberals, Democrats, those people identifying as Black, people aged 18 to 49, and those people claiming no religious affiliation. Now, the folks who believe medical patients' rights should be rolled back include those sympathetic to the pro-life movement and Republican women. Although there was no significant variance among respondents based on gender, the areas of the state with the fewest cannabis businesses, meaning the central and western portions, expressed the most disfavor with current medical laws, while the Bay Region and Southeast Michigan showed the most support for cannabis patients. This latest survey continues Normal of Michigan's long history of asking poll questions in order to influence public policy and show true support for cannabis law reform, and was most significantly employed in the run-up to the 2016 and 2018 efforts at legalizing cannabis for adult use. This poll comes at a time when conservatives and Republicans in the state have just failed to pass legislation amending the medical marijuana law to cut caregivers plant count by 80% and restrict patients in their choice of a person to grow plants on their behalf. The poll's initiators hope that this result will discourage any group from attempting to damage Michigan's 14-year-old medical marijuana law. And full disclosure, I am the executive director of the Michigan chapter of Normal. Interim director of Michigan's Cannabis Regulatory Agency, Brian Hanna, was named full director of the agency by Governor Whitmer early last week. Hanna now leads a department of over 200 employees, a task at which he seemingly has no experience. Hannah's background in law enforcement and in the military may make him an attractive choice for ramping up enforcement actions, but in the short time he's been on the job, Director Hanna hasn't shown empathy for consumers and has used a heavy hand to smack down an industry that just needs a little shaking. His zeal for surprise inspections and very public shaming of cannabis companies who fall outside the lines may put him in a large legal entanglement as his predecessor, Andrew Brisbo, did when he issued a huge recall of cannabis products in 2021. Director Hanna has a tumultuous industry to wrangle and his seeming dismissal of cannabis consumer issues does not bode well for his popularity or effectiveness as a leader of the CRA. As always, we'll keep you updated on the status of Michigan's legal market each and every week. And that's it for the Michigan Report with Rick Thompson on Weed Talk News. We all know the road to legalization is a long one. Once legislation is passed and made law, there are still several hurdles to overcome and fine tuning to do for the industry. And for the state of Illinois, the hurdle to get legal home delivery may soon be cleared. So let's check in with Thomas Howard for more. Hi, it's Tom from Cannabis Legalization News. You can find me at CannabisIndustryLawyer.com, and I'm here with the Illinois update for the week that was December 8th. Yesterday, J.B. Pritzker hinted at maybe allowing delivery licenses in the state of Illinois as he was touring and made comments at one of the first social equity dispensaries that is opened in Chicagoland, that is in Bucktown specifically, that is the Ivy Hall Uh that's the name of the dispensary. Ivy Hall, its founder, uh, co-owner, uh, Nigel Dandridge, has a quote. I am living proof of Illinois making good on its promise to carve out a more equitable cannabis landscape for generations to come. That is, uh, once again, 
That is Nigel Dandridge, one of the owners of the Ivy Hall Dispensary in Bucktown. Pritzker went on to say that all 192 conditional cannabis dispensary licenses have been issued. So look for a lot of new dispensary locations and a corresponding uptick in sales as there's more locations in which for you to buy the product in the state of Illinois over the coming 2023. And uh, Pritzker then uh, had some more comments on it. So let's look at some of his quotes. Much of the challenge has been the court system and the amount of time it's taken to get through the court system. People suing because they didn't get a winner in the lottery for a license. That is what Pritzker said. And then when asked about a cannabis delivery licenses possibilities in the state, he said, at first blush, without the data in front of me, I think as long as it is regulated, as long as we make sure that the person who ordered it is get, gets it and that they're legally allowed, then to me, it would seem like it is the same as somebody coming into the store which means that there may be another round of cannabis delivery licenses for the first time in the state of Illinois. That's something for 2023 because it is done. There have been no new changes to the cannabis laws during the veto session, the lame duck session in the Illinois legislature. They are now on break and they will reconvene in early January. And that's probably when we'll see you next, unless there's a big news out of Illinois next week. That's what we have for you. Please check out Canvas Legalization News on YouTube. And back to you, Elena. Software company Dutchie, based out of Oregon, has long been a leader in technology for cannabis business. But the company is now announcing a major shakeup in its own leadership. Marianne Kursaji has that story and more from Oregon. I'm Marianne from Alibi Cannabis with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Oregon Darling and cannabis tech company Dutchie underwent a major leadership shakeup last week. The board of directors has named a new CEO, new CFO, new general counsel, and a new vice president of engineering. Many of the new executives hail from Toast, a Boston-based tech company. Next, Oregon regulators issued a recall for more than 22,000 cannabis concentrate products over concerns that they might contain pesticides. The concentrates were manufactured by bobsled and quantum alchemy. Selling product that has failed pesticide tests is harmful to the consumer and harmful to the industry. Time will tell what penalties there may be for these operators. And lastly, two long running Oregon companies, East Fork Cultivars, and peak extracts are banding together to diversify their product offerings and strengthen their position in a stale market that's dealing with significant obstacles, including overproduction and depressed wholesale market prices. That'll do it for the Oregon Report this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi for Weed Talk News. There's lots of talk on social equity in cannabis these days, and we've been reporting about how Washington State has been one of the latest to implement programs to address that very topic. Well, now it looks like the state could also be opening that conversation up to the indigenous population of our country. Our own Josh Kincaid explains. I'm Josh Kincaid with The Talking Hedge with the Washington State Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. A new indigenous cannabis association aims to unite America's tribes around cannabis. Many of the 574 federally recognized American Indian tribes are re-recognizing the plant's medicinal healing powers. 21 of the state's 27 tribes have had a cannabis impact with the governor. Some tribes are only cultivating while some are fully integrating dispensaries. Some tribes have just are just uh, farmers. Some are just retail storefronts. Personally, I'm hoping they make some blunts. Tribes are a sovereign nation, meaning that their surrounding states' cannabis policies don't apply. So even in remote rural areas, tribal-owned smoke shops can do quite well selling to tribal members and outsiders alike and having to comply only with compacts made with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and state authorities. Then there's a social good, such as revenues. In Washington State, the Puyallup tribe is putting together revenues into clinical cannabis medical research and partnering with academic institutions, as well as building housing for the tribe's homeless and addressing their social opioid crisis. Next week, you guys are going to find out more about Washington State's cannabis scene with that. We're going to have to roll up this Washington State cannabis report. I'm Josh Kincaid from the Talking Hedge reporting for Weed Talk News. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Not long ago, Pennsylvania's governor encouraged constituents to apply for a marijuana pardon program, and thousands of people did. But 
it turns out maybe the governor wasn't as ready to be as generous as once perceived. But there is at least some generosity happening in the Keystone State. Here's Claudia Post. I'm Claudia Post from Scarlet Express, and I'm here in the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, reporting for Weed Talk News. When announcing the Marijuana Pardon Project earlier this year, our governor, Tom Wolf, said it had the potential to help thousands of Pennsylvanians clear their records. But alas, it has fallen short. More than 3,500 applicants were sent in for the program. It was aimed at wiping out low-level marijuana convictions in a one-time mass act of clemency. Fewer than 250 people will have the opportunity to clear their record this month. A vast number of applications were denied because the cases were for people with more than one conviction. I don't know why they don't clarify things, but often cannabis consumers get multiple convictions when they're arrested the first time. After a paraphernalia charge, uh, then they get a possession charge all at once. That's a real catch-22. You would have to essentially lead a police-free life other than that one marijuana encounter to qualify. How unfair is this? Governor Wolf, do something. Air Wellness is embracing the season of giving. It announced that it would start 12 days of giving in a campaign. Every purchase at a dispensaries will cost $1.12 per transaction. That's pretty good. And, uh, they, help, they will help freedom to grow for minorities and help the Medical Marijuana Project Clean Slate Initiative. Overall, Air Wellness aims to reach a goal of collecting $100,000, which will go towards supporting cannabis prisoners and their families, as well as various other advocacy efforts and expungement programs. Not much going on in Pennsylvania this week. I'm Claudia Post from Scarlet Express, and I'll be back next week to talk about what's hot and what's not. For We Talk News, have a fabulous week. The Green Mountain State gets even greener. Just two months into adult use sales in Vermont, and more stores are getting ready to welcome customers. And cannabis regulators aren't done handing out licenses either. Here's Jesse Lynn Dolan with the Vermont Report. I'm Jessie Lynn Dolan from Nurse Grown Organics and Vermont Cannabis Nurses, and this is the Weed Talk News Vermont Report. A brand in Vermont retailer, Pine Grove Organics, grand opening is on December 8th with Northeast Cannabis in St. John's Berries, grand opening on December 9th. The Cannabis Control Board approved eight new licenses this week, including five cultivators, one wholesaler, one manufacturer, and one retailer. The board sent their draft report to legislators on solid concentrates to the board's advisory committee for feedback. The board will host a public meeting before submitting the report. The board will submit another report to the legislators in January of 2023 on regulating hemp and hemp-derived products, again after public comment. They also announced that the board's general counsel, David Scher, has been selected to serve as state director in Washington, D.C., and will no longer be on the board. That's the Vermont Report for Weed Talk News. I'm Vermont's cannabis nurse, Jessie Lynn Dolan. And finally, the next time you go to Vegas, get ready to get lit in a whole new way. We've told you about the company and dispensary Planet 13 and how they're even expanding to Illinois. But first... At its home base in Vegas, Planet 13 will officially be the first of its kind consumption space in the area. When you visit, you'll be able to watch products being made, purchase products, and consume them all under the same roof. Planet 13 has always had a unique space, but adding a luxurious 420 lounge close to the strip is only going to elevate things. So what happens in Vegas may stay in Vegas, but what happens with weed 
continues to evolve. In fact, it is a whole new world of weed out there, so use it wisely. And that's it for Weed Talk News this week. I'm Elena Pinto. It's a whole new world of weed out there, isn't it? Everyone is learning new ways to titrate, ingest, consume, imbibe, and engage with this plant medicine we call cannabis. Hi, I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media and the host of In the Weeds. And once in a while, the really live business cannabis talk show we call Green Rush on Friday afternoons from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. Now, let me tell you my cannabis story. You know, I've had four major surgeries in the past 23 years and suffer from osteoarthritis with a variety of metal parts in my body and one on deck. Now, thanks to those chronic pain issues, I've been a medical patient in Massachusetts for almost 10 years now. I remember my first trip to a dispensary just outside of Boston, and I told the bud tender I didn't want to smoke it anymore. So I tried edibles, then tinctures, then vaping. And now if I'm going to smoke, I only use the Weejits filtration system. What? The Weejits.com, Weejits, that's weed, W-E-E-D, G-E-T-S.com, is where you'll find the planet's coolest product that cools the smoke from everyone's favorite flower. The guy that started this was a pretty good medical device manufacturer, and he created this maze pipe that cools the smoking process from 1300 degrees Fahrenheit upon inflammation down to just 90 degrees when it reaches your mouth. That's right, 1300 down to 90. That's why this maze pipe is amazing. So here's how it works. You start with that glass bowl, you flame on, and then you inhale nice and smooth so the smoke goes through three different filtration and cooling systems. Now, if pre-rolls is your thing, you can use the Weejits filter that a pre-roll fits into perfectly. That's right, or even a chillum. The more filters, the smoother the draw. Best of all is the price. You can get all this or one or the other for just a few bucks. It'll cool your smoke and you'll give your lungs a break. Now, add in the code of PCM TV and you get 15% off. So just go to Weejits.com and check out the best way to enjoy a cooler smoke with less coughing and hacking and more peace of mind. All that resin and tar is collected in the polyurethane filters that are easy to clean with soap, water, and a few Q-tips. Your lungs will thank you and so will I. which at first I thought, oh, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm an activist, but I have you know, held a bullhorn on the state house steps. Um, I have frequently testified before the Cannabis Control Commission in the state legislature, and, and I'm not you know, shy about criticizing where I see you know, mistakes being made. So yeah, I think that's what differentiates me, just an appreciation for the plant. Uh, and then also I'm a cannabis entrepreneur myself. Um, I've, I've started businesses, uh, so I've lived that entrepreneurial journey. I know how hard it is. It is absolutely a marathon, not a sprint. So I think that, you know, it, I'm in the game, not just on the sidelines. As a broker, we have access to many, many cannabis carriers. So I will go in with two or three uh, quotes for people. The quotes might be 20,000 for one, 22,000 for another, 17,500 for another. Pretty close among the three. What I tell people is it's not the pricing, it's what's included and not included, meaning exclusions. An exclusion in layman's terms is just something that's not included. It's not on the menu. So it's just not included. But if you don't know that, if no one shows you that on page 71 of 150 page policy. You're not going to know. No one knows. I never met one person that says they read an insurance policy. If you do, you know, I got some property in Florida for you.
Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of pro-cannabis media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area, now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge, and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient-first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. So the, long, the reality of the matter is, uh, you know, big banks and small banks are going to be different in a lot of ways. And they're both going to have their advantages and disadvantages. For a business like cannabis, you really have to have an integral knowledge of that business and a real granular knowledge of that business and the players involved in it. And that's why if you look at the banks that are successful to play in this space in Massachusetts, they are smaller banks that are very heavy, intensified personal touch human communication where you don't get a lot of that with the bigger banks. Bay State Cannabis Report is supported by Holyoke Cannabis, Holyoke's finest cannabis recreational experience.